Okay, so um, I've got some banjos that uh, have original flathead tone rings in them. Uh, three of them came out of the factory that way. One of them, uh, I added a, an original ring, and I'll discuss that. So this particular one is a 9524. I forget what the number is. That was a very large flathead batch, which included mostly plectrum banjos. And so uh, this banjo came out as a plectrum, and this is kind of an unusual thing because I found through a dealer an original five-string neck that we put on this banjo, okay? Now, this neck did not come with the banjo. Uh, it's colored a little differently, and if I were to ever sell this banjo, I probably would not include the neck. For two reasons, one, it's very expensive. It's about 15 grand to get an original neck because why would somebody sell a neck? And case in point, if you had, let's say, a $75,000 perfect banjo and that came out as a tenor or a plectrum and you put a new neck, a Frank Nita Uber neck on it, that would be worth 75,000. If that banjo came out of the factory with the original neck, it could be worth as much as 125,000. So that original neck will add 30 to $50,000 on the value. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about this in just a minute because you want to hear a bit playing. So we'll start with Monroe's hornpipe in the wrong key. So. couple different songs on different places on the neck and uh, with each one I'll tell you a little about a little bit about this particular banjo and uh, these banjos I, I do buy and trade these a little bit but uh, they're so hard to get that uh, basically if I buy one and I resell it generally I just get my money back and I get the joy of owning the banjo okay so Let's do uh, some up the neck and we'll go from there. <laughs> Thank you. 
so let's talk about this specific banjo. So uh, this came out of the factory, as I said, as a 9524 serial number. And at some point along its journey, and this was owned by a guy, actually his name was Dub Crouch, and he actually has died, and he uh, owned this banjo for probably 30 or 40 years. He owned a bunch of grocery stores. And uh, so at some point in time, this resonator got refinished, okay? Now, a refinished resonator on a banjo is, doesn't carry anywhere near the discount wood on guitar. And the reason is because all the resonators, and if you look at some of my other pre-war banjos, are made of poplar, okay? And the exterior is a thin veneer, which in this case is mahogany. So if you change the uh, finish on the uh, resonator, it basically doesn't affect the sound at all, okay? Now in this case, the other thing that's interesting about the pre-wars is that, uh, and we'll do a, a close-up of this, is we had different handwritings, maybe about five or six of them, and we had a certain very specific color of paint, okay? So in not all cases, but in many cases, you have the serial number in paint and then a uh, uh, the number in, within that lot, which in this case, I believe is 29, okay? Now, secondly, in this case, we do have the stamped serial number 9524-29 okay see if we can okay now you'll notice there's no uh, label in this banjo no master tone guarantee now that did happen later like in the uh, late 30s early 40s but somebody for some reason decided to refinish the, the rim at the same time they refinished the resonator now the significant thing about this when you're dealing with pre-wars, it's, you, you, uh, it's not that you have to find one that's absolutely perfect because they're so rare. I figured out just in my head this morning that for every uh, pre-war in the United States, there's one original pre-war flathead for every 150 to 200,000 people in the population. Now you think about that. So they're, they're very, very rare. So the main thing when you're dealing with the pre-war, you just have to have an accurate description and then its value is determined from that, okay? The other thing is it does have the original flathead tone ring. Now you'll hear me mention the word Steve Huber. Now, Steve Huber is the uh, person, the only person that I would trust to verify an original ring. And we can go into to why that is, but essentially he spent his entire life making banjos, looking at tone rings. And the way you tell if something's original, whether it be a part, is you take the original part and you set it next to a known original part or two or three known parts. And you look at it and you ask yourself, is it the same? Is this one that came out of nowhere the same exact part as these other three, okay? Now, when it comes to flathead tone rings, it gets pretty tricky because it's, it's just a piece of metal and um, the, they, they don't have any numbers, they don't have any you know, but there are about three different shapes of flathead tone ring. And you've got milling marks, and uh, I've talked to Steve at length about this, Steve Huber, and there's 10 different things he looks for, and it pretty much has to conform with all 10 for him to authenticate it. Now, did he do this based on logic, or what did he do? And the answer is he's taken... I'm guessing over 200 pre-war banjos apart, taking the tone ring out, measure the tone ring, and in many cases, because he's a mechanical engineer and builds banjos, he's actually made an exact copy of that particular tone ring, all right? So, uh, to give you an example of how crazy it goes with this, 
I was at a dealer and he said, yeah, I've got this banjo. I think it's a pre-war. And I said, well, why do you think it's a pre-war with the original flathead tone ring? And he said, oh, I've got a picture of this guy who was the owner holding it in 1954. And they didn't actually make any other tone rings but original flatheads at that time. I, I thought that seems a little strange. So anyway, he took it to a couple of people in Nashville and no, it was not an original flathead tone ring. All right, so, so that's, what, uh, that's what this banjo is. So if you wanted a banjo to go out and play that had the sound that you want, then this would be the perfect banjo, okay? Because you don't want to take a banjo out and play it for four or five years. And at the end of four or five years, the banjo is worth half of what it was because of the wear. And I will tell you that I bought a, an original plectrum that was played by a famous banjo player. And when I bought it, I bought it from my friend who bought it from the original owner. And it was absolutely perfect. It looked like it was brand new. And then I saw that same banjo 40 years later, and it looked like it had been drugged behind a car. It was just almost ruined. So um, anyway, so there is a, uh, a, and this banjo will sound exactly like a banjo that was pristine that might cost twice as much. All right, that's that. So let me do a shock in the corn, and that'll be the end of this. And we'll go from there. <laughs> for the other banjos is, is when you have one of these banjos it needs to be set up properly the tone ring has to be fit properly neck has to be fit properly the head has to be at a certain tension and if all those things are working together you have this sound that it's just serenity it's like going to the Grand Canyon or something you you feel something and it feels so good that you'd actually rather play your banjo at home if you own one of these then go out with friends. So that's it, and uh, hopefully this has been interesting, and if not, just let me know, and I'll shoot the other. Uh, oh, you're not done, Jeff. We're doing all these banjos. Oh, all of them. Oh, in the same video. Okay. So Andy's the uh, producer of this thing, so we're going to take the resonator off the next one. And we're going to do these bands. I just happened to put, there's four of them. And I just happened to put them on a stand in the certain order, and there's no logic to the order. So the next banjo we're going to do is a Granada. And the Granada is a very unique instrument because you've got gold and maple. And when Earl Scruggs heard that sound, that's the sound he wanted. And um, because Earl Scruggs is so popular, a lot of banjo players think of that Granada sound as, as the ultimate. Okay, so we got that. Get the thumb screws. All righty. Okay, let's see if this banjo's in tune. Okay, so what this would be is either a 29 or a 30. 
raised head granada, okay? <laughs> Just before I even apply it, so what happens with the Granada, you can find gold-plated original uh, flathead tone rings, and very hard to find, and we're talking 35 grand, and if you see this video in two years, they might be 40 grand, just for the tone ring, and once again, who do we go to? We take it to Steve Uber and make sure that he authenticates it. Now, they're easier to authenticate than the nickel tone rings because they have engraving on them, which is very hard to duplicate, okay? Let's do a close-up of this. Okay, so you can see the engraving on the tone ring, meaning underneath the tension hoop, you see some engraving there, okay? So that makes it easier to authenticate um, now, in the case of the banjo, all of a sudden you see the label in there and it's been cut on the top. And that means that originally came out of the factory as a raised head. Now, for some reason, I've owned maybe four of these and I keep selling them because somebody will buy the tone rings, then I'll sell the banjo and it's always to go out and buy something else. But the, these banjos, honestly, probably 55 to 60 grand, whereas a uh, Plectrum Granada, the last one that sold publicly, brought 120. So you can get this, which essentially is the same banjo. Once again, go to Steve Huber, have him. He didn't pay me to say this. I just have had some really bad experiences where I bought years ago two what I thought were original flat head tone rings. And at the time, they were only $1,500 each. One of them I gave to Steve Huber for free because it wasn't real. And the other one, I got $300 for it. So I was burnt really bad. So, and, you, and this tone ring is either worth $500 or it's worth 35000 There's nothing in between. You know, it's either one or the other. So let's hear what this banjo sounds like. Uh, Monroe's horn pipe again. Let's try it again. we're doing in this series are one piece flange. That's very important. That's one piece flange because they do sound different. Okay, let's play uh, Shock in the Corn again. <laughs>
show you one thing that uh, a lot of you know about, but I was the reason I kept doing this. Where I, where I did a slide at the end where I go. Hear that? Hear that? What Earl used to do, take a close up of this if you would. Okay, so when he's doing that left hand is what's important. So we go. And he would turn his finger and actually do that backward slide on his fingernail. That's not his finger, that's his fingernail. And that, that sound really comes across on an original flathead. Essentially what's happening is it, uh, it reflects what you're doing, everything you're doing. So, if I was doing a choke on a regular banjo, I might have three different sounds that I can get. But if I do it on a flathead, I might have seven or eight. Once again, the thing has to be adjusted right. You know, neck, good neck fit, good tone ring fit, great bridge, and the head has to be, basically if you use a drum dial, it's got to be at 90, which is a G sharp which happens to be the resonant frequency of the pot. So when the head's at G-sharp, uh, G you get the maximum tonality and volume out of the banjo. All right, so, um, okay, so I had a, a student of mine come by, and he actually bought a conversion, which would have, had a, have a Uber HR30 in an original pot, and he compared it to his Rich Era 3, and all of a sudden, for the first time, he'd been playing 10 years, when he did a slide, you could hear it. When he did a hammer on, you could hear both notes clearly. So, um, I'm going to play, I guess I'll go to the next banjo, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, I think the next banjo I'll talk about where to get your information about a flathead because if there's only one flathead that was made for every 150,000 people in the United States that means there aren't a whole lot of people that know much about them and there aren't a lot of them out there to be found so if you go on a hunt it's possible you can't even find one and honestly to find a flathead um, if you start looking and you go around and you go talk to, you know, Steve Huber and George Groon and some of the other, uh, some of the other guys that are familiar with flatheads, you'll find that they're very, they very seldom even have one. And uh, so, so you, you know, you go around, you, you visit these people, you see some flatheads, uh, you might go to a festival and you ask a, famous banjo player to look at his flathead and usually they'll let you do it believe it or not now it may be a, it may not be an original flathead that's the problem that's why you have to uh, go to somebody that knows what what they're doing and um, and I, I will tell you something else if you brought me and it's called an orphan ring orphan flathead ring now what that means is this ring just showed up somewhere. Uh, somebody may have years ago gone to the Gibson factory and bought a ring for some reason. When they cleared out the factory, that, that ring may have been there and somebody got it. Um, if you came and asked me if this was real, I absolutely cannot tell you. I do not know. I don't have the expertise, even though I've owned probably 40 banjos or more, maybe 45 banjos that had original flathead rings in them, I would not do it. And so I actually quit buying flatheads about 10 years ago because I was so scared of them. After being burnt so bad uh, with buying some about 30 years ago that uh, I just said I was never going to buy another flathead unless I bought it from the original owner. 
And then I called up Steve Huber because I had a banjo and I did want to get it authenticated. But this was a known banjo, so, so uh, I went to visit him and, uh, and got to talking with him a, a lot. And I go see Steve about every six or eight weeks. Hey, we got our dog in there. I don't know if dogs like banjo or not, but anyway. So he, he revived my interest. So I bought, I probably bought in the last 10 years because of meeting Steve and realizing that he could authenticate things. I probably had bought 12 flatheads in the last, uh, last 10 years, maybe even more than that. Okay, so now what we have as our next banjo would be an original five string from the factory banjo. It's an RB75, and now this was made in the late 30s, 38, 39. And what you have to remember, let's see, let's see, the RB75 is essentially the same thing as an RB3, but Gibson in 36 or so, their banjos weren't selling, so they decided to drop the price. Well, some dealers had the threes in stock and they would have been angry if the, the Gibson dropped the price. So they changed the name of the banjo to RB75. And the only, the two differences in a 75, I mean, they're essentially identical, is by that time the hardware was much thicker so it kind of looks better, it's thicker, it doesn't bend like the earlier ones. And the uh, binding on the, on the resonator was uh, slightly thicker, okay? You can see that. Of course, you can't see that unless we compare them, but... And then the other thing that happened is when Gibson would machine the flathead tone rings, on the face of the tone ring would be the machine marks. Well, for some reason, starting around 37, they polished the front, and that is called a shiny face. And uh, yes, wanted to make sure this had a shiny face in it, or I'd be telling you something that was wrong, okay? So we're gonna play this banjo, and then I'll show it to you a little bit, and... Uh... All right. Ah, what have we been playing? Oh, okay, okay, here we go. Three, four.
that last break I played uh, is one that uh, Steve Huber made up, I think. He may have stolen it from someone else. But uh, that just signified, and of course, maybe we'll get Steve to shoot a video playing it. I'm sure he plays it better than I did. But anyway, so, but the, the point of that is Steve is an excellent banjo player, and that has really helped in his development of his Uber banjo and also his authentication of the original flathead banjos. Because if you're a banjo maker, it's really helpful if you can put something together and then just sit and play it immediately instead of having to call other people over. You know, like uh, some people are good friends at J.D. Cross. If they really want to hear some banjos, they call J.D. and he comes over. Well, Steve doesn't have to do that. And it just means he can do his research and he can test a whole lot more ideas than the average repair person. Okay, that's, that's all about that. Now, okay, this is an original RB75. Now, this is mahogany on the resonator. And we talked about resonators and uh, we, uh, anyway, that's the resonator. Now, the Made in USA sticker, what that means is that uh, it was made and shipped out of the United States. I have no idea where it went, and then it came back. You'll notice there's no serial number on this resonator. And that was common uh, in the late 30s with Gibson. They didn't have serial numbers on the, band, on the uh, resonator, and they didn't have uh, serial numbers inside the shell. So in this case, let's, we talked about inside the shell. So here we have the master tone label, not cut. And it's hard to see this, but that is a shiny face, meaning there's, there are no grooves in it. But I don't, I don't know that that's going to show up in the, uh, in the video. Um, okay, so the other thing that's interesting about this is the L brackets you'll, are much thinner later, and you'll notice that when you tighten the resonator on these, I call them newer banjos, the 30s, that they actually bend a little bit because they're so thin. All right, so the other thing about this banjo, look at it. Look at that neck. It's got a lot of wear on it. And uh, so uh, the cameraman just... <laughs> We had our dog in here. Well, we did have our dog in here, and I think you saw it, but uh, these are fairly uh, uh, not necessarily real serious videos. I mean, it, I guess if you're going to spend fifty or $100,000, you, you should get serious, but I'd, I'd say more detailed. Make sure that you've checked everything out. But anyway, so uh, this is a uh, maple neck, okay? so. A lot of the 75s, and this is an RB75, which means regular banjo, uh, had a maple neck. So some had maple, some had mahogany. Now the most famous maple neck 75 actually was owned by Curtis McPeak, and he called it Old Betsy. So it was similar to this banjo with the exception, I don't know what the exception, oh, it had a different headstock on it. In other words, this has a floor de lee and I think his has a almost uh, what's used. I don't even know what it's called, but anyway, it's a different uh, headstock pattern. So this banjo is all original. And just to, sh to show you something, now here here's a interesting point because this banjo actually the neck has some cracks in it that have been repaired. All right. Now, interestingly enough, normally when something cracks like that. The veneer, which is really thin, will crack, but this didn't crack, which is weird. So when you look at it from the front, you don't see that. So the um, what's what's the whole point? Well, the point is th this is the banjo I've had it for about three years now, and this is a banjo that I've never sell because it fits my unique characteristics. In that, I want something that I don't. When I take it out, I don't have to worry that I'm going to put a little scratch on it. Secondly, the neck is really thin and I have small hands, so that works out. 
and then being an original five string, the, the five strings do sound better. Those necks vibrate differently. And um, obviously, and I, I didn't steal this banjo. If, I, if you knew what I paid for it, you'd be shocked. I mean, I paid much higher than what you think it's worth. But uh, in fact, several people have tried to buy it, but be, it just suits me. So if you can play some banjos and find one that just works for you, um, I'm not saying that, that you'd like this banjo. It just suits me. If you have real big hands, no, it's not going to work. The neck's too thin, okay? Um, but if you take, if you've got an original flathead, you're going to be able to get all these sounds out of it that you can't get from other banjos. It's similar to a Stradivarius violin. So if you had a $100,000, $150,000 original flathead five-string banjo, and it was set up properly, played, you would get the same feeling from that banjo as if you had a Stradivarius violin, okay? So let's just say $125,000 versus $6 million, okay? So the fact that you play the banjo and not the violin, you're really lucky because you can get into that feeling. Instead of paying six million, you can get you know, 125, and if you don't get an original five-string neck, you can get into it for you know, maybe 60 or $70,000. And, uh, and that's going through a reputable dealer with uh, good descriptions. Uh, that's that's basically it and if you're somebody who'd like to get an original flathead I, I I've got a couple here but I I don't I I will trade and sell them but that's not my business I'm not advertising to do that um, so you certainly could come by and look at the banjos but uh, I would go to Steve Uber who right now, many times doesn't even have one of these uh, but it, he he usually has one of his personal banjos but anyway so you could call him call me call me first maybe and I'll tell you give you some hints on it and that is pretty much it as far as this banjo and we have one more banjo and then we're gonna uh, So as the um, camera keeps rolling, we're getting the very last banjo out, which is a very late um, 1944, one of the last of the uh, flatheads to ever be made, and it is a TB-75. And let's talk about a term you'll hear called floor sweep. Due to World War Two and getting ready for the war, there were restrictions on what you could use metal for. So somewhere around 38, 39, somewhere in that area, they quit making parts. So if you ordered a 1940 or 41 banjo, they would go around and see what parts were laying around and they would put together a banjo. So, uh, in some cases, you might have a, uh, a top tension banjo that had a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think, a top tension resonator on a, on a three banjo. Uh, or you might have a top tension tension hoop. You know, you just have all kind of just mixed up things. So, um, and they do sound good. In fact, I think that, uh, personally, I like all these flatheads. Uh, and once again, there's a difference just in setup as far as what sound you get out of it and, and what they sound like, you know, what they feel like. So the setup is extraordinarily important. So, okay, so now we'll look at this very last banjo. And... Uh, and we might even tune 
tune this thing. Okay, now this banjo is absolutely almost perfect. Pristine. So this is a banjo that has never left this building, basically. just ever come out of the Gibson factory and it came out as a tenor with a six neck on it which doesn't look anything like this banjo uh, there's there's no serial number on this banjo which was common I just showed you on the uh, uh, RB 75 original five string the serial number is actually on the back of the neck but because they used this odd neck there was never any serial number involved uh, and they included the neck probably because it was the only neck that was available and somebody wanted to play it as a tenor but anyway so uh let's let's do our let's do our thing here so here we go characteristic of this banjo is that it's one of the last Gibsons ever be made and it was purchased from a collector well the collector's wife because the collector had died and he had had the banjo we don't know it probably up to 40 years because I had gone up to he's a customer of Frank Neitz and I had been up at Frank Neitz and heard the name of this guy he was out of New York 
but he moved to Kentucky. So he had about five or six really, really extraordinary banjos. And 30, 40 years ago, you could sometimes find something in this condition. All right, so let's look at this resonator for just a second. Okay, this banjo has that look or feel of something that maybe was made yesterday. Now, there, there might be a little smudge or something here or there. There might be a little, uh, I think there's a little mark on here. I, well, I can't see it now, but it's, it's there. Uh, anyway, so the banjo's essentially brand new. Now, the serial number on this banjo, which is 5638-3, and there are a couple of these. Once again, I keep using Steve Huber's name. No, he's not paying me to do this. He, he's just done me a lot of favors, so I figured. And, I, and I'm trying to do you guys a favor by sending you to the correct person, okay? And once again, the other thing I was going to say is when I look at a banjo, I first of all figure out what it is, and then I figure out what it's worth, okay? So since Steve has entered the picture, bingo, I can take it find out what it is, and then I know uh, how much it's worth. Okay, so that's the resonator. So I'll put the resonator right there. And then the hardware, look at that. Now, just so you know, nickel will smudge if you just touch it, but the hardware is almost brand new. You can look at the tailpiece and I didn't bother to put a new head on it, but we could put a new head on it and that would look perfect. And then the shell, you'll see it's a three-ply hard rock maple shell. It has the shiny face tone ring and it's got everything that you would want. Um, and it's, as I say, it's a 1944. Um, and just one other little detail, and I think it was about 1939 or so, 38, that the Phillips head screw was finally invented. So most Gibson banjos, 38, 39, and on have Phillips head screws instead of flathead that hold the L brackets in, all right? And so this is a Frank Neat neck, okay? So it's a new neck, and uh, it matches very nicely. And this is a banjo that if somebody wanted to have a flathead banjo and wanted to have something that was really nice and wasn't a professional player, meaning maybe sounded as, as good as a professional, but wasn't going to drag this around to festivals and take it out in the rain. I would hate to... I mean, if, if somebody called me up who was a professional wanted to buy this banjo, I would, I would discourage it. I really would, because this thing is a piece of history they're almost impossible to find anymore and uh, anyway that's it so if you have any comments just write them in there um, if you have any questions I'll be happy to talk to you you can come in and look at these banjos but there's no way over the phone I can authenticate a banjo you know even if it has pictures take a video I I uh, it just wouldn't happen, you know, because, and I don't want to mislead anybody. Um, but all these banjos, we know exactly what they are. And uh, so everything I've said has been based on multiple experts looking at these banjos. And uh, that's basically it. So if you have any questions, uh, you can send me an email, you can call me. Uh, and that's basically it.